by his good deeds to me, and they reported my words to him. And Tobias sent letters to intimidate me. It's the word of the Lord. Amen. You guys can take a seat. Uh, Good morning, friends. My name is Alex. I serve as one of the pastors here. Good to be with you guys. We've got an extra Bible up here in case anybody wants one. Um, So, um, yeah, we've been walking through the book of Nehemiah for several weeks now. We're in chapter 6. We're asking God to continue to be at work in our hearts as we have been walking through the book of Nehemiah. We've seen uh, just over and over and over again this opposition that keeps coming after the people of God as they desire to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. We saw in chapter 2, we kind of started to see Sanballat and all the rest of the enemies start to come up and start to ridicule Israel in some different ways, specifically Nehemiah. They tried to kind of poke at him, and then, hey, they come back in chapter 4, and there's more opposition as they give them these threats. They kind of surround the city in some ways, and they want to kind of stop them from moving towards rebuilding the walls. They're not successful, and here we get to chapter 6 where we see the story continue on, where it feels like there's just another new angle in which they're coming from to make sure they attack the people. It's as if the enemy continues to persist over and over and over again. So the question becomes... How's Nehemiah going to respond this time? How are they going to continue to go forward? How are they going to continue to ask God to be at work in their own lives? And if you look specifically in this section of Nehemiah chapter 6, it's a slightly different than the other ways that we've seen the enemies oppose them. They come after the leaders specifically. They come after Nehemiah directly. They try to attack him in these different ways. And what you see as you read through chapter 6, as we just kind of read together as a church body, the word intimidation comes up. Over and over and over again, the word intimidation continues to repeat itself through these verses. And so through intimidation, we get to see, hey, here's one way that the enemy opposes us. But what does it look like for us to respond today? What's it look like for us to stand tall in the middle of intimidation? Well, uh, let's kind of step into the text again. Let's read the first nine verses once more, Nehemiah chapter 6, to kind of see our first way that we stand against intimidation. It's through continuing God's important work. Verse 1 of Nehemiah chapter 6, it says, When Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I'd rebuilt the wall and that no gap was left in it. Though at a time I had not installed the doors in the city gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent a message. Come, let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. They were planning to harm me. So I sent to them saying, I'm doing an important work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same proposal, and I gave them the same reply. Sanballat sent me this same message a fifth time by his aide, who had an open letter in his hand. It was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem agrees, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. This is the reason you are building the wall. According to these reports, you are to become their king and have even set up the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf. There is a king in Judah. These rumors will certainly be heard by the king. So come, let's confer together. Then I replied to him, there is nothing to these rumors you are spreading. You are inviting them in your own mind, for they were all trying to intimidate us, saying they will drop their hands from the work and it will be never be finished. But now, my God, strengthen my hands. So the first way we see them respond to the opposition, the intimidation that's kind of headed their direction is through continuing on God's important work. Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, they come back again. And now we start to see, oh, the project's getting done. They're they're this close to kind of finishing everything up. The walls are rebuilt, and all they have to do are install the gates, the doors, to make sure everything's ready to go. And the enemy just wants to slide in and try and attack them one more time so that they can stop this whole project from actually being completed. They send this message to Nehemiah, and they're like, Hey, uh, what if you come see us in the Ono Valley 
and we're going to have a little meeting. We're going to have this political get together so we can kind of talk about how are we going to actually like uh, work together as these different leaders of these different places so that we can actually walk and work through this together. Now, the actual trek from Jerusalem to the Ono Valley is about 27 miles. They don't have cars back then, so it's, it's quite a walk, quite a bit of travel for Nehemiah to go, and Nehemiah starts to actually see what they're really doing here, and he's like, no, he knows that they're trying to harm him. He doesn't fall for it. He doesn't stop and say, yeah, I'm going to go meet with these guys who have been trying to attack us for the last several weeks. He actually stops and goes, no, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to have this meeting. I'm doing important work. I have a job to get done. There is a task set before us that God's kind of encouraged us to continue to go forward, so I'm not going to. Now they send the letter four times. Over and over and over again, they continue to persist. Hey, come meet with us. Come chat with us. Let's figure this out. Let's get it all worked out together so we're going to be okay. But Nehemiah says, nope, that's not going to happen. And then the fifth time, they send this open letter. Normally, letters would have been sealed to conceal the message of, to who it's going to. But what they do is they're trying to be sneaky here. As they send this fifth letter, this fifth open message, they send it with an aide. And guess what? Anybody ever opened up somebody else's mail? Okay, come on. Somebody has. <laughs> I have. Uh, by accident. Not on purpose. And it was kind of open a little bit. But you start thinking, hey, yes, that's a perfect message. I want to read it. I'm kind of nosy. You want to see what's going on inside of it. And so the open letter, the open message, what's it read? It says, hey, it's reported. This is them writing, Sanballat, writing this to Nehemiah. He says, it's reported among the nations that Gesh and Geshem, he agrees. You guys are trying to rebel. You guys, are, you guys are trying to lift yourselves up and kind of rebel against the Persian king. You've got your prophets in place saying that you're going to be the king of Israel. You're going to be the king of the land. You're going to rule. So if an aide is taking this open message to Nehemiah, and if he reads it because it's open, he's going to start to see, oh, these guys are rebelling. These guys are trying to go against the Persian king. And so you can start to see how that would travel across the people. They'd be communicating. People would start to think, oh, man, this is not good that Nehemiah is trying to take over. He's trying to cause this whole rebellion and shake things up and get rid of the Persian king. But that's not at all what's happening in the middle of this because Nehemiah gets a letter and he can clearly see what they're trying to do is deceive the people around them. They're trying to point all the eyes back onto Nehemiah and to say, hey, this guy's actually not a good leader. He's trying to rebel. He's trying to go against the Persian king, and they're kind of trying to attack him and be deceptive in these different ways. And what Nehemiah tells them this whole time, he's like, nope, that's wrong. You're lying. He doesn't sit there and try to defend himself, though, because he knows who sent him. Think back to chapter 1. He went before the king. He went to King Artaxerxes. He asked to be able to go back to Jerusalem. He asked for the wood to be able to rebuild the wall. He asked for uh, all this stuff, and the king blessed it. King said, go. So Nehemiah is not like shaken in any sort of way throughout this. He's confident in what's happening before him. He's confident in what God's doing. And so he tells them that's not actually the truth. That's not what's happening. And we continue on to see them wanting to be deceptive in this different way. And we start to see, okay, what's their ultimate goal? What is the goal that the enemies of God are trying to do in this moment? They're trying to distract them. They're trying to get Nehemiah to stop working, to stop rebuilding the wall, to stop leading God's people. Read verse nine with me. What's it say? So we pray to our God. Oh, wait, that's chapter four. Uh, verse 9 in chapter 6, it says, uh, For they were all trying to intimidate us, saying, They will drop their hands from the work, and it will never be finished. They're trying to distract them. They're trying to get them away from doing God's good work. But Nehemiah shuts it down. He knows he's supposed to continue to do God's work. I mean, it gets to the point to where the enemy persists so much that in verse 9, at the end of verse 9, what's he do? Lord, would you strengthen my hands? You ever been intimidated or bothered so much that it feels like you're just about to give in? It, you're about to cave in because it feels like it's just too much for you to bear? 
I love what Nehemiah does there because he goes, man, this, the persistence is, is getting to be a lot. This is the fifth letter. They're sending this open letter to start trying to confuse the people to make it seem like I'm doing something I'm actually not. Lord, would you strengthen my hands so that we could continue the good work that you've sent us to do? We start to see, man, they're really trying to distract them. They're trying to stop them from doing God's work. And as we think about it today, the enemy loves to distract us from completing God's work. We've said it over and over again over the last several weeks. What we see time and time again through these last several chapters is that when God's work is moving forward, the enemy desires to stop it. He wants to put a stop to what God is doing because he ultimately wants to lift himself up and rule the world rather than God himself actually continuing to rule and reign and send his people out on mission and to encourage them to continue to partner with him in what he's doing. But for us today, we start to think, okay, I don't have some guy named Sanballat sending me a letter to ask me to go to the Ono Valley to stop me from doing God's work. But what does it look when distract what does it look like for distraction to actually come my way? Cuz if we're all honest, we live in a world that could be very distracting. There's always things that are clinging to us, asking for us to give them attention. There's always more work to be done. There's always more people that want to meet with us. There's always more things that are kind of clamoring for us to spend time on them. And what we see Nehemiah say here in this section, chapter 6, what's he say? How does he respond in the middle of it? He says, I'm not going to come down. Why? Because I'm doing a good work. He's focused on the work that God has set before him and the work that he's continuing to move forward to. And we ourselves need to focus in and continue to say, man, what's the Lord put before us to continue to work on, to continue to press on forward and to say, Lord, what's the mission that you've set before us to go through with you and that God, that you would use us for your glory, for your good, for your, uh, for your mission to continue to go forward. Man, there's distractions all over. Just think about even the workplace. You start thinking about your work and what it looks like for you to continue forward and be a good hard worker. You could be fighting distraction in several different ways. You can be distracted because you're like, oh, social media is like right there. One click of a button and you sit on your phone for 10, 15 minutes and you do that over uh, three, four, five times. You've almost wasted an hour of the work that you're kind of doing. You think of uh, all the activities that there are. I mean, you can think of constant activities that are gripping for your attention saying, hey, come to this on Monday, come to this on Tuesday, come to this on Wednesday. And your schedule is so full, you're exhausted and you're like, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm so tired and I feel like I have no way or no sort of... Uh, uh, distraction or no sort of comfort to actually take peace in. We fight distractions all over our world, friends, and we can be distracted by good things too. We can get distracted by our comfort, by ease of life, by desiring a great reputation. We can get distracted by vanity, by materialism. We can get distracted by our promotion of ourself. But Nehemiah, he doesn't focus on himself at all. He says, I'm going to do God's work. The mission that's set before me, that's what I'm going to focus on. He knows his calling. He knows what God's given him to do. He knows what he's supposed to do. And because of that, he's staying focused to continue to move on God's mission. Now, if we think about ourselves today, each of us, each of us have a calling that the Lord's given to us and to actually participate in the important work. I think sometimes we can kind of get confused too because we're like, okay, what's my calling in life? We start wondering the question like, well, what am I supposed to be doing? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? I wrestled with this a lot with college students when I was doing college ministry. And so there's kind of like two ways to really consider what's the mission that God's called us to? What's the work that we as believers are called to? There's like a, a general sense of calling. This is stuff that all all Christians are called to every single believer. And then there's like specific callings that's like specifically on your life, the calling that your is right in front of you. So as we think of like our general calling as Christians, what are each of us as believers in Christ called to continue to do with God? What's the work that he set before us? These are things like worshiping him, 
responding to who he is. Like we're supposed to be good stewards of the things that he's given us. We have a mission and the great commission to continue to multiply disciples, to ask God to use us for his glory, to evangelize the lost, to point people back to Jesus. We're called to disciple one another, to continue to lift one another up, carry each other's burdens, encourage one another and point each other back towards Christ. And the question might be, if you aren't feeling any type of opposition, if you haven't ever felt any type of opposition in your walk with Jesus since you've come to know the Lord, it might be that you're not actually stepping forward in faith to continue on the mission of God. And it's sometimes confirmation that you're actually pursuing God's glory and God's goodness is the fact that Satan's kind of coming after you in some different ways. Why? Because he loves to stop what God is doing. And so for us, like if you're wrestling with some different things, that means because Jesus is using you for his glory. He's using you for his good as you're multiplying disciples, as you're maybe meeting with some people and you're encouraging them in God's word. And if maybe in the back of your mind, you're kind of feeling like, man, am I really doing anything? Am I actually like caring for this person well? Am I pointing them to God? That might be like lies that the enemy is trying to feed you as you're trying to encourage and multiply disciples and move people towards different directions. Now, these specific callings, this different way to kind of think about, okay, am I actually doing what the Lord's like got for me today, what he's put in front of me? These things are right in front of our eyes. We don't have to think about it and kind of be like, am I I doing what the Lord's called you to? Like, am I actually moving forward? Man, the question becomes like, what's right in front of you? Do you have a neighbor? Yeah, all of us probably have neighbors. Man, the Lord's put them right in front of us. It's our calling to go forward, to love them, to get to know them, pursue them, hope that Jesus would open doors so that we could share the gospel with them and and care for them. Do you have a job? Guess what? The people in your workplace are like a mission field. That's an opportunity to engage one another, to work hard for the Lord, to honor him with what you're doing daily. If, If you're a parent, think about, man, you've got a mission field in your very own home. That's an opportunity to engage the kids in your house, to put down the cell phone, turn off the TV, play with them a little bit, engage in rich relationship, do some family devotionals. Man, if you're single, the Lord's placed an opportunity for you to serve in different ways, to have more time to be able to serve other people and care for them. If you're married, God's placed a spouse right in front of you for you to pursue them, to care for them, to love them, to honor them, to respect them, and to continue to point them back to Jesus. If you're an empty nester or retired, this is a sweet opportunity to invest in the next generation, to pour out the wisdom that the Lord's given to you over the dozens of years that you've lived life, and to pour out that wisdom to the next generation so that they would be encouraged by what God's doing in your life, what he's taught you, so that they would be fueled to continue to go forward. We all have a mission. We all shouldn't, none of us really have any sort of excuse to sit on the sidelines. The Lord's calling us to important work together as God's people. He's inviting us to continue on the work before us. And sometimes distraction can kind of get in the way. I mean, think about the different ways that you might be distracted. If you're you're sitting there thinking, man, there's some days where I'm feeling like, I really want to start praying with my family some more. But then when it comes time when you're like, oh, let's let's pray together before bed or let's pray together right now for someone we just got a text about. And then you start thinking, oh, but I never really do it. Is that going to be weird? Should I actually do it? And then your kid comes up to you and something happens and then you get distracted in some different way from actually maybe taking a step forward and being faithful to pray together as a family and leading them in that way. Maybe you're sitting here and you're kind of thinking, man, we've asked for uh, people to kind of serve in these different ways. Or maybe you're thinking, man, maybe I should step up and serve with the kids ministry in this different way. And then you kind of feel like this tension of like, but I'm not a great public speaker. I've never done that with young children. I've no really, I'm not really sure I could actually do that. Man, that might be like a way that the enemy is trying to deceive you and distract you in this different way to get you away from actually moving forward and actually discipling the next generation and investing in people. 
There's all these different ways that we start to think that we could be distracted. Maybe you start thinking, I want to commit to community. I want to commit to God's people and and actually engaging in life with one another. And then you start thinking, well, I've got this event this evening, that event that evening. And sometimes I just like, I just need a night to have to myself. And so I'm not going to be in city group because I've got all these other things that are kind of taking up my time. And see, there's all these different ways that the enemy can deceive us, distract us, and move us away from actually engaging what God's called us to and the mission that's set before us. And so the question to wrestle with is where is the area that you get distracted with? What is it that maybe you're pausing and going, man, what am I not actually engaging forward in? What am I not pressing forward with the people who are around me? What has God put right in front of me that I could continue forward on God's good work? But maybe I feel like I'm getting some letters in some different ways and being distracted to move towards something else. What ways am I actually putting down the work to do something else? The question becomes, hey, how can I ask God to strengthen my hands so that I can continue forward on his mission? That's a question to wrestle with, but it's not the only way that we get deceived or distracted in this whole mess of life. We see here in these next couple of verses, 10 to 14, read with me uh, another way that the enemy intimidates us. Uh, Read with me, starting verse 10. I went to the house of uh, Shemaiah, son of Deliah, uh, son of Meth- Mehabel, uh, who was restricted to his house. He said, let's meet at the house of God inside the temple. Let's shut the temple doors because they're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you tonight. But I said, should a man like me run away? How can someone like me enter the temple and live? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him because of the prophecy he spoke against me. Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired so that I would be intimidated, do as he suggested, sin, and get a bad reputation in order that they could discredit me. My God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat for what they had done, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. So the second way that we kind of see intimidation start to come forward is through this deception that's kind of happening. We start to see Nehemiah, he's getting time with this prophet Shemaiah, who's the son of Deliah, son of Methabel, who was restricted to his house. So we're kind of like, okay, why is he restricted to his house? What's what's going on there? Why is this prophet like staying in his home? Well, sometimes prophets would actually act out the prophetic word that they're trying to give to the people. So they would have this message and they would be saying and communicating something, right? Think of Jesus when he goes in and he flips the table in the temple. He, yeah, he's rebuking everybody for what they've done to the temple. And yet at the same time, he's also demonstrating physically what they've done to the temple. So we think here, okay, this prophet is locking himself in his house to kind of show to Nehemiah, this is what you need to do. These people are attacking you, and so you need to hide. You need to restrict yourself so that they won't come and they won't kill you. And then he gives this message. He almost speaks it as if it's from God. He says, hey, let's go to the house of God. Let's go inside the temple. Let's lock ourselves in there so that way they can't get in to kill you. Nehemiah kind of responds back, why would a man like me ever do that? Should I, should I run and hide from the enemy's attack? Should I run and hide to stop the work that we're doing? No. Nehemiah starts to figure out, man, this guy was actually hired out. He was hired out by Tobiah, Sanballat, Geshem, all these people who are trying to stop him to do good, God's work. And the way that they're attacking him, intimidating him in this moment, is they're trying to discredit him again. First, they did it with the letter, and then here they're trying to deceive him because if Nehemiah was to actually go into the temple, he's not a priest. That's not allowed for him to do. He'd be falling into sin. He'd be breaking the law by actually doing this. And so Nehemiah knows, hold on, I'm not going to break God's law for my own safety. I want to honor God and respond to him in the way that he has encouraged us to continue to live. But they say, hey, you should run from God's enemies. Hide here with us. And they're trying to be deceptive. So that way, if he were to break God's law, if he were to not honor it and fall into sin, what would people think of him? 
they'd start to think, why would we follow Nehemiah? He's not a man who's leading us towards God. He's hiding for himself while he's telling us to build with one hand and have a trowel in the other hand. He's not being courageous. And so Nehemiah knows exactly what is true. He knows, I'm not going to go and hide, one, because that's not what God has for us, and two, because I've asked these other people to actually stand courageously and fight for God's glory and God's goodness, and three, I would be in sin if I did that. So he stands strong, and the reality is, if Nehemiah did not know the law, if he was not being courageous, he would stop and he would maybe go, Yeah, that does sound like a good idea. I don't want to get killed. But he stands on the truth. He stands on what is true right before him. And it's important for us. Another way, as the intimidation kind of comes, it's deception. It's small lies that sound really good that we think, well, maybe we can do that. Or maybe there's some wiggle room there. Maybe uh, it'll be okay this one time. Because God saved me and he's got grace, so it's all right if I maybe step into sin in this way. Well, for us, it's important to know, man, the enemy loves to deceive. Think about what he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. He just slipped in there when he came and said, hey, take of the fruit. It's okay. It'll be all right. Did he actually say that you would die? And he deceives Eve, and so they take of the fruit and they eat it. He loves to feed us with lies and different attacks in this way. And we know that it's important for us to not be deceived. Romans 12, verse 2, be transformed by the renewal of our mind. Why? So that we would discern what is good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. 1 John 4, verse 1, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There's a lot of false teaching out there. There's a lot of things that aren't true that try to deceive us, try to trip us up, try to lead us in the wrong direction. And if Nehemiah didn't know the law, he could easily have gone into the temple. And for us, what ways is Satan trying to deceive us and intimidate us in these different ways? Sometimes you might start to think, man, I just don't know enough to answer people's questions about who Jesus is or what the scriptures say. When, or maybe we start thinking, man, I don't have this like perfect devotional. We start feeding ourselves these little lies as we're deceived to move on forward. But the scriptures tell us in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says we're equipped for every good work with the scriptures. God's given us his word so that we could stand on the truth. And if we don't know it, how are we going to know what's true and what's not true? It's important for us to continue to know what is true so that we can uh, fight the lies that might be coming into our minds with the actual truth to communicate truth, to encourage ourselves, but also encourage the people around us. They can attack our identity, and we might start thinking, man, if the deception starts to come like, I don't know enough, God doesn't love me, I fell into sin, and so he's mad at me, I start thinking, man, am I actually lonely Does my community not care about me? These are all subtle things that the enemy loves to deceive us with, to move us away and to stop us from actually moving forward towards God's mission. Think about any time you start to believe a lie. What's it get you to do? It stops you from going on the good work that God has set before you. It paralyzes you in these different ways to where you go, man, I I don't know if I should continue on forward engaging these different people or or move towards community or uh, run towards the lost because I'm finding this lie that like I I don't know anything would if I go to city group for the first time are people going to judge me because I don't know everything it if I engage that coworker and I ask them for lunch and we start talking about like our backgrounds and they ask me a question about Jesus am I going to be able to answer it These are all subtle lies that we get paralyzed by, that deception starts to creep in. And what we need to do is stand on the truth of God's word and God's promises to continue to use us so that we can continue on forward on God's mission. I mean, this kind of happened to me in a different way where I was thinking about, man, what's something that's like deceived me recently? 
And I got asked to uh, speak at like a, a speak and share at a FCA event this upcoming week. And I started thinking, oh, that's a really cool opportunity. That's fun. I get to go share the gospel with a bunch of high school students. And then I started thinking, oh, maybe I should say no to this because I got asked to go speak at an event. And if I go speak at an event, my ego is going to get really big. Right, because I know like, I have these tendencies for my pride to kind of blow up. And I'm thinking, no, okay, I'm not going to actually go go share the gospel with high school students because of my ego. And I stopped and I started thinking about it, and I was like, that's so dumb. <laughs> like, this is a sweet opportunity to go and share the gospel with a bunch of kids who don't know Jesus and to point them to him. Who cares about my ego? Like I get to tell people about who Christ is. And the point is really about Jesus, not about me. And and so I started thinking, man, I was being deceived. I was kind of feeding myself lies for like several days. I'm asking a bunch of people like, hey, do you think I should go do this thing? Like I, and, and what, what I came down to was like, why would I say no? for an opportunity to proclaim the savior of the world to people who don't know him. Like that, that's, that's the ways, the sneaky, subtle, tiny ways that Satan loves to stop us from going forward on God's mission. Sure, even if I did say no, they would have found somebody else to actually share the, share the gospel with people. But that's somewhere, a way that he was just trying to kind of sneak in. You know, a couple weeks ago, we talked about, hey, what are your weak points? That's like a weak point that Satan kind of started inching at me to deceive me so that I would not go forward with sharing the gospel with lost people. But I started to realize, man, this is all about Jesus and not about myself. And there's different ways that we can be deceived when the intimidation starts to set in in different ways. And we navigate, hey, what is actually true? And in that moment, I had to go, what is actually true? The Lord's called me to share the gospel with people. So I'm going to go share the gospel with people and ask that Jesus would bless that and that God would continue forward in those students' lives so that they would know him and for us to continue to navigate. Man, what is true? How can we stand on God's truth so that we would not be intimidated by the lies or the deception that the enemy tries to come at us with? So that's the second way that intimidation sets in. The next thing that we see in this passage is that we get to have confidence in God's wins. So read with me last couple of verses. Here we go. Verse 15, the wall was completed in 52 days. That's pretty fast. On the 20th day of the month of Elul, uh, when all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence, for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. During those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, since he was a son-in-law of Shechaniah, son of Arah, and his son Johanan had, met, or had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. These nobles kept mentioning Tobiah's good deeds to me, and they reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. Again, we start to see, praise the Lord. Even in the middle of opposition, intimidation, attacks, lies, deception, all this stuff that's happening, 52 days, guess what? The walls rebuilt. I mean, this is miles long. This is not some small little retaining wall that you're kind of thinking, man, that feels like a big project to figure out how to do in the backyard of my house. Like this is a wall around the city of Jerusalem. They completed it in 52 days. God's enemies did not conquer God's people. There was no lie, no division, no intimidation tactic that would stop the Lord from completing his mission. And that's a good thing that we're able to see. And I love how Nehemiah responds in the middle of it. As the wall is completed, we don't really read a response from Nehemiah himself. But as he's journaling, as he's writing this down for us to read today, who's he give credit to? The Lord. He doesn't say, hey, I led the people to the point to where they followed me and we built the wall all together and we did it. No, he says the the enemies were intimidated by the work that God had accomplished. God's the one who gets all the credit because they're the ones who were just following God on the mission that he set them out on. 
And you start thinking, man, this is the big climax of the story. They finished the wall. Everything should be perfect at this point. But what happens? The wall's done, but the intimidation shifts. We start to see it tells us, hey, the enemies of God, they were intimidated and they lost confidence because of the work that God had accomplished. But their loss of confidence, their intimidation, it doesn't stop them from continuing to try and intimidate Nehemiah. What do they do? The Jewish nobles, because they're in this weird bond to Tobiah, they start, okay, we're going to send letters over to Nehemiah. Then Tobiah starts sending letters to Nehemiah. They're trying to intimidate him. And what's happened here essentially is because this bond that the Jewish nobles have to Tobiah, they're kind of coming together to write these letters to Nehemiah. And in one sense, they're saying, hey, the project is done, Nehemiah. You need to start thinking about who are you going to actually place here because you got to go back to the king. You got, your project's over. You got to go back and do your job as a cupbearer. So who are you going to place? In, in, who are you going to place in, in rule of all of us now? So they start moving towards. Hey, give it to Tobiah. Hey, you got to get out of here. Put this next guy up for us. And we know Tobiah's a bad dude. Like he's been trying to shut this whole project down this whole time. We don't really have the conclusion in chapter 6, but in chapter 7, we see, hey, who does actually Nehemiah put in charge? Tells us in chapter 7 that he puts in a God-fearing man, a man who feared the Lord in charge of the people so that they could continue pressing on towards God. And this whole thing feels weird. We feel this tension because it's like the wall's done. God's accomplished his mission. Why are the enemies still coming after us? Like, wouldn't we think like, yeah, victory, it's all over, it's peachy, roses, everything's great, rainbows, yes, this is what we're going to do. That's not at all what happens. And so it leaves us with like this awkward, already not yet feeling. And the same is true to this very day. Because we see God's wins we see God continuing to accomplish his mission in different ways. Like even think about your own life. The, the fact that you have come to know Jesus, if you have, is an accomplishment from the king. Like his death was victorious enough to actually raise from the dead, give you new life. And you start thinking, well, after I become a Christian, shouldn't life be perfect? Why does the enemy still try to deceive me and attack me in the things that I used to struggle with before? Why isn't everything perfect now here today? And it's the same tension of knowing, but Christ has victory. And yet at the same time we go, why am I feeling the persistent attack of Satan in these different ways? Friends, we know the end of the story. Satan will be bound. Sin is defeated. Jesus has victory, and we get to enjoy that victory until the end of the days, until all of it is completely new when Christ has returned and restored everything. If we've trusted in Jesus, we get to look to him for the, the celebration, the rejoicing, the win, the accomplishment of the victorious king for what he's done in our lives. And yet at the same time, we live in the tension that sometimes it gets pretty hard here. So how do we fight that? It's with the promises that we're seeing here in Nehemiah. What's he do? He focuses on God's accomplished work. And so as you're wrestling with different things that Satan's maybe trying to deceive you with, intimidate you with, attack you with, look to Jesus. Look to the finished work of the cross, the victory that we have in Christ, and that propels us forward. Ask him to strengthen your hands in the middle of suffering, in the middle of horrible circumstances, and in the middle of intimidation, attack from the enemy, whatever it is that you're wrestling with, to continue to look to the king. Don't be distracted by the enemy, but continue on God's work. Why? Because you can look to the work that he completed and the work that he will do. It's this tension of both looking forward and looking back to what he's done and what he's going to do. And so that spurs us on to continue to stand by the truth of what he said, what he's done, and encourages us to continue to say, I'm not going to be distracted from the work that's right before me. 
I refuse to be distracted in the discipleship of my family. I refuse to be distracted in engaging my neighbor who doesn't know Christ. I refuse to be distracted in the moments when God's asking me to just sit down and worship him one-on-one. I refuse to be distracted in the moments where God's continuing to press us forward to engage in rich relationship with one another and saying, hey, what's it look like for you to actually confess maybe some sin and bring that into the light? It's for us to continue forward on God's good work. We all have a mission to continue forward on that God's given to us, and we get to look to Jesus and celebrate the amazing leader that he is, the great victorious conquering king that he's given us new life. By grace, the free gift of Christ is here for us. Nehemiah is a good, righteous leader that we read of. We get to see a story and we're like, man, that that dude loved the Lord. He responded to God in great, beautiful ways. But we know a greater leader who faced intimidation just like Nehemiah. Think about it. Jesus came to this earth and he faced Satan in the wilderness. Satan tried to deceive him by giving him the whole world rather than making him take the cross. Satan tried to distract him by giving him bread when he was in the middle of fasting. He tried to tempt him by taking the easy way out. Jesus faced political leaders just like Nehemiah did, who conspired together to try and get him to stop doing the Lord's work. But Jesus did not stop. He focused on the mission that was right before him, and he went to the cross to die for sinful people so that they could have everlasting life, rose from the grave so that we could look to him and say, This God accomplishes the promises that he set out to accomplish. He continues to do what he said he would do. And because of that, we trust in him. We will not be deceived. We will not be distracted. And we'll continue to focus forward on the mission of God that he set before us. So we too can stand confident in what Jesus has done. We too can look to the enemy's task to continue to be per- persuasive and try to uh, be persistent as he comes after us. But remember that we have victory in Christ and in Christ alone. We stand on that truth. That's the truth that we look to as God's people. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that uh, we're able to just look to Nehemiah and see uh, just uh, an example of a man who honored you. Uh, We pray that you would stir up our hearts and our affections to look to you, Jesus, as he looked to the God and the, the one who sent him to go forward. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen our hands. We pray that you would uh, use us for your glory, for your kingdom, for your good. God, would you help us see the different ways in which we're being distracted? Uh, If it's something as subtle and simple as our phones, uh, Lord, would you help us put them down so that we can engage in conversation and the pursuit of people around us? Lord, I pray that any lies that may be coming our way, any things that are in the back of our mind that are deceiving us from moving forward on your mission, Lord, I pray uh, that you would give us truth to fight those with. Would we know your word? Would you remind us of who we are and what you've done for us? And uh, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so that we could go forward in confidence, standing on the great victory that you have. That we could focus on your wins, your accomplishments, the work that you've done, and the work that you will do, Lord. Would this sustain us? Uh, Would you continue to equip us? Would you send us out, Lord? Would we be on mission uh, to continue forward for your glory? 